What up my ninjas? Donald Fofra here. Welcome to my review of Raphael Mutant Apocalypse. Now, these episodes will be tricky to objectively analyze simply because they were hard wrenching, highly unexpected, it's a little tricky to take a step back. With that being said, I have strong opinions about this episode, you don't have to agree with me, but we're going to be in for a deep discussion either way. Now first off, these episodes were highly unexpected. I mean sure, the season 5 has an anthology format, that doesn't mean I was looking forward to a dystopian future with many of our beloved characters dead. The writers, however, knew what they were doing. First off, a slower pace helped us as viewers catch up to speed. Keep in mind, had this happened in other arcs where it took the Turtles three episodes to just find one another, I'm pretty sure our viewers would be calling foul. But in this case though, as I said, we actually needed that. On top of that, the intrigue, even with the slower plot, really at least kept me on the edge of my seat. Raph, as an unreliable narrator, was actually a smart way to go. His questionable sanity and absent memory means that he doesn't know what's happening, really, and we're joining him alone for the ride. We want to know these answers to our deep questions. Now, the tension was strong enough from the get-go, but thankfully there were some lighter points throughout the episode to bring it down a bit. There was some humor, especially with Raph pointing out how similar the episodes are to their life. That was meta AF. On top of that, the touching side of these episodes got stronger and stronger with every reunion. Now, what I really needed to stabilize myself throughout the entire, uh, throughout the entire arc, really, was each character staying true to themselves one way or another. Despite the trauma, despite that it's been 50 years, apparently, Watching Raph's sarcasm come into play, Donnie's scientific know-how, Mikey's crazy fighting, I needed that as well. Before we get into the unfortunate aspects of these episodes, there are a couple more absolutely awesome things to talk about. The animation, by the way, was rather breathtaking at times, if not downright cool at others. The machinery, the action, and the landscapes, as I said, were really fun. Well, it's not fun. As I said, they were really cool. The references as well. I mean, I have I have not seen a show that did references, or maybe I've not seen a Ninja Turtle show that did references as well as the 2012 show has done. Going from external ones like Mad Max, let's see, Game of Thrones with Leo's many titles, and on top of that, Archie Comics was featured with Casey's American Mask. FYI, check out Dan Spitlero's blog, he points out to a couple of those references. So all of those put together gave some extra oomph and substance. But the real heart, I think, in this episode came from the internal references, really to take us back to those more innocent days, like Mikey's tidy whities are you kidding me? April's Tenson, the hanging in the shell razor, those were a couple that I noticed. Bree Sand 1993 though, big props to him or her because uh, they also pointed out Karai's helmet and bike. Long list of really fun references. So I do applaud the writers, the animators for that. But as I said, so like I ugh, wholly and thoroughly appreciated these episodes. For one, I think they were a little too grim and gloomy. This was my, I think my complaint similar to Requiem when Splinter died. I didn't see the reason for it. Why, uh, I, just to recap, why should Splinter have died when he's, when he doesn't deserve it, he's been hunted for so long. But I realized afterwards <laughs> that there was a certain rhyme and reason there. Splinter did die too early, however, He's lived a rather significant life, he's been happy, whereas the Shredder has been so full of vengeance that now that Splinter was gone, there was actually nothing left for him. So sure, he lived an extra day, but it wasn't actually meaningful. So there was, there was the give and take with Splinter and the Shredder, but when it comes to the this series finale, I'm like, 
Where, where is the rhyme and reason behind the devastation the turtles have faced? What happened to Renette's, I wouldn't even say prediction, like it was a fact that the turtles were legends, at least to the masters of time. Where in their journey has that happened? Hmm, big question marks there. But on the point of questions, I didn't appreciate that what, everything that's happened to April, Casey, and their other allies were completely unanswered. If we get to see <laughs> Ice Cream Kitty again, it's only fair that we get explanations behind this big mystery. The mutagen bomb, who made it and why? Like, if our hearts have to be torn apart, at least we deserve to know why. <laughs> that is my personal opinion when it comes to these episodes, but as I said, you don't have to agree with me. There's more to life than scavenging. Mira the Meerkat. Hmm. Creative name when you think about it. Nonetheless, this character had two purposes. First off, kind of as a plot device. Her backstory as an orphan made her more relatable to the turtles in particular that helped spur the episode forward. Her drive and hope gave the turtles the extra boost they needed to find each other. That being said, she is more than a plot device. Even though her backstory and her mission gave the episode some direction, she was a character in her own right. She was fierce, resourceful, hopeful, in so many ways her own character. I can understand how she survived on her own for a little while, but at the same time, she reminds me of April way back in the day when April was focused on saving her dad and wouldn't let anything stop her. She brings back the youth that the turtles have lost throughout their 50 years of suffering. And I do appreciate that she's sticking around with the turtles in their beautiful paradise. It actually has me wondering what sort of silly shenanigans the five of them will be up to. Uh, a, a tree? It's an elongated perennial plant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for getting all sciencey, Don. Donnie and Mikey changed in their own aspects. There's, well, Donnie being a more of a robot now. I think it was Dan Spathlier in his review that mentioned there's a certain poetic justice to that because Donnie has always loved technology. Now he is one. If that makes you a little sad for him that, you know, he's never going to really feel again, I mean, that's, I mean, it is unfortunate, but Donnie's not upset by it, so maybe it's worthy to celebrate. Mikey, on the other hand, <laughs> he. Reminds me of Greg Sipes, if I'm going to be completely honest, because I'm pretty sure I've seen the voice actor in almost the same sort of poncho. The two of them have like free loving spirits, so I love that the animators put that touch of the voice actor straight into the show itself. Now on the topic of voice actors, I want to give Rob Paulson a huge prop for this episode because he was the only way for Donatello to emote at all. The guy sadly does not have a, any way to form facial expressions. All he has are the little cute choppy like ears. Not much to work with. Rob Paulson did a great job and I could envision Donnie's expressions in my mind. Like seriously, the guy deserves an award. But going back to the episode itself, I have to admit, Donnie and Mikey were the least changed, personality speaking, by everything they've endured. Neither of them were willing to let their circumstances take away from their ideals, from the hopes that had kept them strong in the past. That's so resilient, like five decades of suffering, and they're still hopeful and optimistic. I aspire to be that strong. <laughs> oh, what a day. What a lovely day. I know I mentioned off uh, the top of this review that the patchy storytelling left more questions unanswered than answered. It is a shame, but 
I think making Raph an unreliable narrator was a smart choice. For one, there was his wavering sanity, as I said. It actually showcased how lost the guy was without a mission. I mean, come on, he's the warrior of the team. He's the muscle. He needs a mission. It's something more to life than scavenging to keep him together. So I wish there was more emphasis on the state of his mental capacity, at least, as the episodes progressed. And on top of that, Raph was never the thinker of the group. For him to suddenly become a strategic, tactical genius is changing the character to fit the plot, rather than the other way around, as it should be. I do want to mention Raph's core personality traits. There's obviously his raw power, and that definitely came through in the action. However, there's also his pessimism and sarcasm. Like Raph, as strong as he is, and as passionate as he is, he is never one to just throw himself into happiness without understanding what he's getting himself into. We definitely saw that in these episodes, what with his reluctance to care for Mira, his disbelief around the Holy Chalupa to begin with, on top of Oasis in particular. So those defining characteristics were very, very welcome. Somehow, I'm back. Thanks to all of you. Now if I could give an award to the most changed turtle, it would go to Leo. I was not expecting him to become a raging dictator. Now, let me mention that him throwing his brothers out of harm's way, and FYI, those tears, heart wrenching. It's as, he, it's as if he knew he was going to die. So anyway, <laughs> I, I see him being so selfless and at the same time alone, especially through his second mutation. It's kind of like Splinter in a way, right? Man, that talk about full circle. Getting back to the point though, it's one thing for Leo to change physically, but to change so much in his personality seriously rocked me. Now that being said, there was a certain poetic justice in this episode, with Leo, having saved his brothers, becoming the villain that's trying to destroy his brothers, then becoming, then actually being saved, I should say, by his brothers. There is a big circle. Because as Mikey has said once before, the solo Leo act, Leo getting super protective and sacrificing himself, does get old after a while. So for his family to come save him is very sweet. Now that being said, I still have an explanation for Leo's drastic personality change. The mutagen. Duh. If it worked his body, why would not it why wouldn't it, I should say, warp his mind? Much like Leatherhead, who endured terrible experiments at the head of the crane, but through some help from the turtles and some work on his own, he controls his will to become more manageable. Leo was much the same way. It took remembering what he was about and who he was, and the help, of course, of his family to do that, that brought Leo back. That being said, it's not as if Leo changed entirely. The core of his personality as a leader, as a competent commander, that remained intact. It goes to show that Leo was meant to be in charge. I just want to point out that Raph completely undermined Leo without realizing it, because he actually won over Leo's army. If younger Raph had known about this, I'm pretty sure younger Raph would have been like, yeah, go me. But Ra older Raph did not mean for that to happen. He just wanted to save Mira and survive. That was his goal. <laughs> so that is just, that's just so ironic and I, Love. I actually do love that. Family, we're home. We are home. <sighs> now that, all being said, that's my review everyone. I do hope you enjoyed it. We do have a tough question of the day though. Now this episode, as I mentioned, where these episodes were meant to be the series finale, the last arc. 
If you don't believe me, you can check out other reviewers. The TMNTpedia page also has information about it, but there is plenty of proof within the episodes. A, the production codes. They were the last ones made. Keep in mind as well that the Turtles watched the final episode of Space Heroes The Last Generation. The anytime they watch the last episode of anything, you know it's the end of the season. Let's see. There is a clip of Leo at the end, old school Leo, <laughs> holding a katana and a sign for Kevin and Peter, just showing the cast's love for the work of the original Team and Team Lords. <laughs> But there are, there is more. I'm probably forgetting one or two other facts. You can comment down below for what exactly I am missing. It's bugging me a little bit at this point, so help me out. Just goes to show. Oh yeah, I remember. The fact that there's no way out for the turtles. That there, as Dan Spitlera said in his review, there's no what if. No, what if this happened? This, these are the consequences. So don't mess up the mutagen bomb. There's no future toy to take them back in time. It wasn't a dream. This was 1000% real. I know there was someone, probably on Tumblr, who pointed out that season five is about different futures. So you could imagine season four being the be all end all, and then season five presenting different endings for the show. You could interpret it that way. But regardless, season five, Oh, sorry, I should say Mutant Apocalypse is the end of season five. How would you feel about this series being the last? I've already made my piece. It's a little too grim and gloomy, personally. I think the turtles deserve better. But you're welcome to disagree with me. Maybe you've seen the rhyme and reason behind the gloom. I would love to hear from you. Until the next episode, ninjas, we'll talk then.